So for those of you who don't know, my name is Clinton Monchek. I am the Executive Director of Farm and Food Care Saskatchewan, but I'm also a farmer from the Lanigan area. So my brother and I farm, um, I have a grain farm where we have uh, multiple different commodities. We also have a table egg farm um, where we have eggs and, and any given day we have anywhere between about 7,800 and 8,100 eggs that get produced on the egg farm. The reason why we decided to have a presentation around farming and, and trying to make sure people understand how food is grown uh, sustainably is we have a lot of discussions that are taking place um, uh, online or in social media around sustainability. And I think it just probably would, would help to have a little bit more discussion from a farmer's point of view in terms of what are some of the things that we're physically doing on our farms um, to ensure that we are actually growing food sustainably. And, and I'm going to go through a little bit of the history of, of not only Canada, um, but the, the agriculture history and, and how we've gotten to where we are today. So just for those of you who don't know who Farm and Food Care is, uh, and I know um, quite a few of you are um, um, participants from, from uh, events that we put on in the past, uh, but majority of our membership is from commodity groups, different agriculture businesses, the government, uh, rural municipalities, um, and we're a nonprofit organization. So what we're doing is trying to make sure we have the ability to engage with consumers like you about how food is grown and, and why it's grown in the ways it is. And, and really, if, if we had a, uh, what I would say, a perfect world, um, all the consumers here in this country would have a better understanding of what farmers and ranchers are doing and, and why they're doing it. And we do have different opportunities for you to uh, check that out. Uh, one national opportunity is CanadianFoodFocus.org, um, which kind of looks at all aspects of Canadian food and farming, uh, where there's uh, farmers and ranchers who are talking about how they grow their food. But we also have dietitians and chefs and, and different scientists talking about um, the background of food as well. So before I get into this, I think it's probably pertinent for us to just have a little bit of a history lesson of how we've got to where we are as a country. So when you think about the last 154 years since uh, Confederation, we've adopted a substantial amount of new technologies. And, and if you just go back and, and try and picture back in the, the you know, the founding people of, of uh, Canada during Confederation, um, the main source of transportation would have been wind uh, on their sailboats and, and ships, uh, as well as horses, actual horsepower to do a lot of the work. Uh, and we've adapted so much since then to go to things like combustion engines, all the way to now that we have uh, really uh, high performing electrical, um, um, electric powered engines as well. On the communication side, I just think of how difficult it would have been back in those times to actually communicate with people back in England uh, and throughout the world. And uh, now we know within nanoseconds of events that happen in, say, Asia or Brazil uh, and around the world. All this has kind of changed and in, in, in we've adapted some of these new technologies, but it's also happened on the, the science and healthcare side as well. We've produce different options for um, our own well-being to make sure we can live longer uh, and be healthier, but we've also provided different opportunities and options on the food side of things to make sure we're healthier and we can, uh, again, live longer. I, I think of the, um, the opportunities we have or the, the benefits we have for just clean drinking water. We um, very rarely have to worry about the water coming out of our tap. Um, because we live in Canada, a first world country, but that's not the case for everybody else in the world. And a lot of these changes uh, that we've had resulted in us living longer and being more educated. So here's an example of um, the mortality rates from cancers. These are different, eight different cancer types in Canada. And you can see the vast majority of cancer uh, deaths on a, a per capita basis have followed that declining basis, meaning that you know we're living longer in terms of whether or not we have um, we contract cancer, we can live longer or have a better quality of life along that, which results then in the increase of our life expectancy. If you go back to the 1920s, 
Um, the life ex uh, expectancy was roughly 60 years old, all the way to where we are right now. Um, and, and really, this is updated stats from 2020, indicating here in Canada, um, the average female lives to the age of 84 and the average male 80. So if you average the two of those, roughly 82 years old. Uh, back when I was a, a youngster growing up, I just think to myself, that was uh, quite a feat to have somebody in their 80s or 90s and very rarely into their hundreds, but yet we see more and more of that today. So we're living longer. This is something I, I my, my wife is, is uh, American and I like to bring this up periodically, the fact that Canadians are actually more educated uh, than other countries throughout the globe. The interesting fact around this is when you have more education, you have more disposable income. When you have more disposable income, you have the opportunity to ask for differentiated products. And, and if you, you think of, um, say, go back into the 1940s or 50s, when you went to get bread, you got bread. Now you have options of whole wheat bread, white bread, quinoa bread, flax bread, a whole different um, uh, set of options that you have because, again, we're uh, uh, more educated and have more money to spend on that. Now, that aside, we've also changed our demographics in terms of how we've lived. And this is actually one of the key points when it comes to agriculture when we think of how we've progressed as a country. So if we go back into, um, say, the, uh, the, the Confederation years, we had roughly 80% of the population who lived in rural Canada. It's completely flip-flopped to the point where now we have more of the population living in an urban centre, and roughly around 81.5% right now living in urban Canada. Now, what that means is if you go back in the generations and you go back to, uh, say, your teacher's generation or your grandparents' generation, there would have been more knowledge of farming practices and how to produce food because you would have been around it more. And even if you weren't around it, you grew up in, in the Toronto or in Vancouver or in Saskatoon, um, you would have had your aunties or uncles or your parents or your grandparents, all these different people who you would have trusted to get some of that information about how that food was actually being produced. Well, we've moved past that. We've moved a, a generation or two away from that. And as a result, there's more questions that come up about farming and not necessarily enough farmers out there to give those answers. So you have pictures like this. And I don't think anybody on this, this presentation here today thinks that uh, we still farm with horses or we have threshing machines. But we've advanced quite a bit in, in how we produce food. And I'll say that maybe some of you, when you see these pictures, don't fully recognize how the advancement in agriculture has taken place. I want to point out the picture on the left of this is my son Jackson. Quite a few years ago, he's um, quite a bit taller than that now. Um, but it's to show the sheer size of some of these uh, pieces of equipment. That's the back tire on our harvesting unit and, and the smaller of our two harvesters. Um, but they're just, they've become very large. Not only that, is the inside of the cab is full of sensor technology, new technology uh, that guides the combine, adjusts the, the height of the header and adjusts my, my sieves in the back to make sure I'm getting clean grain samples. This is the, the, the movement of agriculture to where we are today and there's sometimes some holes that, that consumers have with that picture because they're not fully aware of how much things have changed. So when we kind of dive in a little bit deeper, and this was a census taken in 2016, you can see how the number of farms has or, sorry, decreased substantially, but the size of the farms has increased. So if you look in 2016, the average size of a farm would have uh, 73 pigs, uh, 65 head of cattle and roughly 800 or sorry 483 acres of cropland and I can tell you right off the bat um, that would be an extremely small farm in the prairie provinces so if you look at maybe an organic farm or a horticulture farm uh, you might have this the size that would be 480 acres or smaller and roughly speaking an acre is the size of an American football playing field um, but our farm um, has about 3,700 acres that we plant every year, plus our, our pasture land on top of that. So you can see that the sheer size and the growth 
has led to less farmers making the way for people who are living in the city to make sure that they can have adequate amounts of food, not only here in Canada, but throughout the globe as well. And, and we've done a good job um, in the agriculture industry by using science and different technology to advance the amount of uh, food that we're making, not only, again, to feed our country, but the rest of the world. So here's where I want to kind of hone in a little bit more on um, our specific farm and talking about sustainability. So our farm, our family farm, is probably not a lot dissimilar from a lot of the other farms that are out there um, throughout this, this country. Uh, my grandfather started uh, producing food for others back in the 1920s. And we've evolved using different science and technology to grow food more productively, more efficiently. And one thing that people don't necessarily realize is more environmentally friendly. The other thing that I want to talk about is, is how people like to romanticize uh, the good old days. And, and I hear this sometimes from individuals that, you know, the back in the day in the 60s and 70s, you know, those were the, the good days. Well, I can tell you, um, I watched my dad clean our dairy barn with um, a, a fork and a shovel um, and a wagon hooked onto a team of horses back in the early 80s. Um, I don't want to go back to those days. Uh, now we have automated manure belts and, and we can actually, in, in our barn of 8,500 uh, laying hens for table eggs, we can actually clean the barn in about 21, 22 minutes. Um, and it's just by flipping some switches and pressing some buttons. Um, we have to watch it to make sure it doesn't go off kilter, but at the same extent, you know, if we were having to every day clean that barn by, by uh, hand, um, it would be almost impossible for us to keep up. So, um, and then obviously uh, some of the farmers of, of the, the good old days have issues like my father has with uh, bad knees and, and hip replacements and stuff like that. But if you look at the intent of the progression of family farms, the intent is to make sure our sons, daughters, nieces, nephews have the intention or have the ability to actually receive that land or that farm in a better state than when we got it. And this is really the, the notion that I have around sustainability in terms of how to make that happen. Now, different graphics are out there in terms of what sustainability looks like, but this is the three pillars that I always kind of come back to. The environment gets talked about the most and, and that'll be the focal point at the end of this presentation. But I also want to talk about the societal and the economic points as well, because without those two aspects, I don't believe we can have sustainability in the long run for Canadian agriculture and in terms of what we do. So I want to relate this back to all three of these uh, areas. So in terms of sustainability within our society, now, now, not only do we live in Canada as a whole, but we actually live in different sub-societies, or sometimes people say communities within communities. And what I mean by this is when you're part of a community, and I think of, say, my grandfather's era, when there was adoption of, say, things like combustion engines and tractors, the first people who adopted those practices likely would lead to others in the community adopting those practices as well. But now we've grown with a lot of this information and what we have as good farming practices, um, say in, in Saskatchewan, are being transferred over to uh, Russia or uh, the Ukraine or throughout different parts of, of South uh, America right now with our planting technologies. Similarly, there's different technologies that we're adapting right here in, in Canada that are based on practices in, say, Australia or the United States. All these things have the ability to adapt. Now that's on the farming side and, and the agriculture side, but remember there's also the changes from society within Canada as well. Like I mentioned before, Canadians have higher disposable incomes, so they demand differentiated products. So if they're demanding differentiated products and saying, I want quinoa bread, then we have to start growing quinoa here in Saskatchewan to make sure that market is actually being uh, fed. The other thing is, as our technologies have increased with uh, sensor and the ability to detect different things, we have actually increasingly safe food. 
And that's not the same like I mentioned in other places. When I lived in Mexico, you couldn't necessarily count on the safety of certain types of food. Here it's kind of a given when you go into a grocery store that everything that you're going to pick out of that grocery store is going to be safe for consumption. And you have different practices that are in place from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, if there are trace amounts of, say, E. coli or salmonella, very quickly that notice goes out to the public to say, hey, if you have this barcode, please throw it out. It may be contaminated. So the, the point in this is not only are we adapting to society's needs right now, but we have to continue to adapt to whatever society wants in the future. Now, the second pillar here around sustainability is the economics. And really, we need to make money to keep on farming. And, and we're no different than any other business that's out here in this great country. Um, but we have to do it by controlling some of the different things. So we can control our, our, our revenue and our ex expenses. Um, but things like fuel and repairs, market fluctuations. I, I get a kick out of market fluctuations because um, my brother and I were chatting back in, in 2017 uh, and always had the little bit of a joke that we wish we would have been able to buy Twitter insurance um, because um, from 2016 to 2020, um, President uh, Trump could actually put out a, a 280 character tweet or a message that could have uh, drastic implications in the market fluctuations that affect my ability to actually produce uh, a profitable uh, crop on, on my um, farm just by the fluctuations in the price. So <clears throat> we also have other things that we're trying to control like our fertilizer and our herbicides and our feed. And I'll, I'll get to a little bit of that, how technology has helped us with that. But the biggest thing that we can't control is weather. And this is where our bread and butter comes from. If it doesn't rain or rains too much, we can either have a crop or not have a crop. And here's an example of, um, I guess you could say a little bit too wet uh, to get out to seed. And, and you can see if you kind of hone in on the uh, right side of the picture, you can see the trees are already green. So it's, um, things have germinated, it's springtime, things are growing and I'm trying to plant and it's too darn muddy, muddy and uh, wet out there. And of, of course, um, when I called my father to come out with the other four wheel drive to pull me out, his first comment was, what the heck are you doing driving in there? Which makes obvious sense right now, but it didn't at the time. Hence, I got stuck pretty bad and had to get pulled out. Uh, tornadoes, uh, hailstorms. Uh, this was a tornado that touched down about a, a mile away from my brother's farm or his acreage. Um, and with that brings severe weather. You, you have the possibility of hail. This crop that uh, is growing right there is a malting barley crop. Uh, had we got hail on that, it would have uh, decimated it and, and we would not have been able to actually uh, have a, a productive crop of uh, malting barley, which is used for beer. Here's another one, frost. Um, I was out uh, swathing, so cutting the crop and putting it into a, a windrow to dry out. And we ended up getting frost in late August. And I was about 200 acres uh, behind. So those 200 acres that I didn't uh, get cut before the frost happened, downgraded that number one Canadian canola to a number three Canadian canola. And that ends up costing me money at the end of the day too, because now I don't have the ability to have that um, higher valued crop. So this is what gets talked about the most. And I, I think with the conversations happening with the uh, Trudeau government here in Canada and now with the Biden government in the United States, it has become more front and center. The idea of climate change and what we can do to the, uh, within our environment to make sure we're making a conscious effort to uh, uh, reduce our environmental footprint. And, and here's, I think where a lot of people want to talk about, but don't necessarily fully understand what the aspects around the environment that farmers are looking at and how we're actually being very good environmental stewards of the land. And really it's all about the dirt. As, as simple as it sounds, the soil is the lifeblood of our existence. Without good soil, we don't have the food. Without the food, we don't have the people. And this was one of the fundamental changes that we established back in the mid 90s on our farm 
to the point where now it's around 98% of all farms in Saskatchewan use this production practice, which is called minimal till uh, or zero till. And it's the, the um, directly planting into the previous year's stubble. And what I mean by that is when you harvest the crop, instead of tilling that crop up uh, to prepare the soil for planting, you're actually leaving that soil where it is. So all that straw from the previous year's um, crops is left there to decay or rot. And as a result of that, it builds up over time organic matter. And the picture on the left signifies that. There's more earthworm population now in our soil because what's happening is with more organic matter that's staying on the soil, it promotes more earthworm production too because earthworms that help uh, decompose that matter and put it into usable nutrients for the soil. And a lot of the reason, and I'll get to a, a little bit later on, that we were doing this is to prevent the land from blowing away. And uh, we'll talk about the advancements in some of those technologies, and I have a video for that as well. But all to say, that is one of the single biggest environmental impacts we've had uh, as farmers and, and, and agriculture people uh, here in Saskatchewan. And we, on the ranching side, we've also decided to rotational graze cattle to allow a, a thicker, uh, more dense root structure as well for the grasses and, and forages that are growing. The picture on the uh, right is just an indication that even with all the different technologies that we have on our farm, we still have to get on our hands and knees and, and use a, a old school uh, measuring stick, I guess, uh, to see where the seed is actually being planted, to make sure that is, the seed is actually going into the moisture and going at the depth that we want it. So like I mentioned, the soil really is the lifeline of human existence and, and all the pleasures that we have around with the, the ability to have teachers and nurses and doctors and, and computer scientists and all these different things lies within the ability to make sure we can feed our population. And this is one of the stewardship programs that our farm has adopted called the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program, which um, we actually ranked fairly high in when I took the, the course last fall. But what it means is we're trying to place the right uh, fertilizer at the right rates, the right time and the right place, um, all to make sure that when those nutrients get into the soil, that they're gonna be used by the plant and produce the optimal crop or the most optimal crop as possible. And this is where it comes to the care for the soil and what we do. So my background, I'm an economist and I can talk to you about numbers until I'm, I'm red in the face or blue in the face. My brother is a, an agronomist, but neither one of us are soil scientists. So as a result of that, what we do is we pay for the advice of a soil scientist to come out in every one of our fields. They're gonna take little soil probes and take samples of the soil and come back to us and say, well, based on the soil profile and what nutrients are already in there, these are the level of nutrients that you need to grow the optimal, in this case, a canola crop. So you can see kind of partway down, we have the different macronutrients. You can see N, uh, phosphate, potassium, sulfur, and then a whole bunch of different micronutrients. And it actually tells us exactly what nutrients we need to grow that crop. So for example, for this uh, canola field, I'll need to put down 90 pounds of nitrogen, 40 pounds of phosphorus, and 24 pounds of sulfur. Notice it said, don't even bother to put down any potassium, which is uh, potash, because there's already enough on the, the land for that. Now, if I was growing something like malting barley, it may require a little bit more or some of that. But because of this, then we can actually pinpoint for our fields exactly what nutrients that soil needs without spending too much money and being environmentally friendly to make sure we're not over applying things like fertilizers. Here's the, the example that I was giving in terms of minimal till or, or direct seeding. Um, these are pictures, actual pictures uh, from Saskatchewan all through the, the prairies down to uh, Texas. Um, that showed what happened when we tilled the land. When we tilled the land, there was nothing, there was no root structure to actually hold that land down. So when it got hot and it got dry and the wind blew, it would blow the land. And I know you're probably thinking from some of these pictures, well, that was back in the 30s. And I can tell you, when I grew up in the, the 80s, 
there were still farmers that would summer follow the land, which is uh, don't plant the land and just till it uh, throughout the summer. Uh, you'd have to stop and turn on your lights to drive by some of those fields because the, the soil would be blowing like this. Now, the reason why farmers did that is they were trying to control the weeds. Now we have different technologies like glyphosate, uh, sometimes uh, under the brand name Roundup, that actually allows you to actually kill those weeds so you don't have to till the soil and you can directly seed into the ground. And I have a video here to go through this and it's kind of hard to see in the video the, the background in terms of the, the dust, um, but I can tell you the, the, um, the atmosphere had quite a bit of dust blowing in it um, and uh, this video kind of highlights a little bit of that. It's uh, May the 24th and uh, just finishing up, uh, got a couple days left of planting for 2017. But I wanted to show you all that dark sky in the background there, that is dust. Winds are gusting right now to uh, right around 90 kilometers an hour or 55 miles an hour. And you can see how dusty that sky is because we got dirt blowing. Sorry. Now, if this was the 30s, without modern farming practices, where we uh, got a couple days left of planting for 2007 right. hour or 55 miles an hour, and you can see how dusty that sky is because we got dirt blowing. Now, if this was the 30s, without modern farming practices, where we're directly seeding right into the ground, and you can see my stubble there. I'm putting that seed directly into that ground and look at how much it's blowing. It ain't blowing a heck of a lot. If this was back in the 30s, the sky would be black. It would be black and I would not be able to see in front of where I am right now. So thank your lucky stars for technology and the fact that we have the technology we do to seed directly into the soil to make sure our land doesn't blow away. So it's interesting, something as simple as that actually fundamentally changed the way farmers can actually plant that crop and be environmentally friendly to keep that soil from blowing away. Some of the new technologies, and sometimes people don't realize how advanced some of this stuff is, but remember before when I said we had different um, requirements for the land? Now this is a computer that actually adjusts my fertilizer to make sure I'm going, it's putting, being put down in the amounts that I require it to in the different areas of the field. So you can see that it's gonna vary the amount wherever it is, and it's also gonna automatically shut off when I've already planted that crop. So if I've already planted, and you can see, um, you know, I have a 65 foot uh, wide um, planting system, and when it goes where I've already planted, it shuts off those sections. And it's all in an effort to make sure I'm not overusing fertilizer, which then reduces the possibility of that fertilizer leaching down, and it's saving me money. It's a huge uh, cost benefit for me to do this. And this technology goes further, and this is uh, one of the new technologies that we just purchased um, last year. And what this is, is this is our high clearance sprayer. But what you can see is each individual nozzle will turn on when the individual GPS sensor says, I have not actually put down the herbicide in this area. And just so you watch it, you can watch at the end of the boom all the way to the main frame, how this works. amazing technology and it's, it's cut our, our herbicide costs down substantially as a result of that. The other technology you could see it was pulsing um, and as a result of that pulsation uh, it actually shoots that down uh, more so the wind doesn't drift uh, that herbicide somewhere else. This is kind of the, the summation of all of this. So not only is my farm doing this, our family farm, but other farms here in Western Canada are doing it as well. And typically when you hear about emissions from agriculture, whether it's the livestock industry or grain farming 
or the, the different practices that are out there, they're talking about the gross emissions. So for example, when you start up your vehicle, those of you who can drive, start up your vehicle and you burn that, that uh, fossil fuel, the carbon goes into the atmosphere and it's gonna stay there for uh, a thousand plus years. Now, in agriculture, we still have to start up those diesel engines and, and my, my combines and, and sprayers and everything run on diesel. We also have fossil fuels needed to produce uh, the synthetic fertilizers and, and herbicides and fungicides and things like that. However, we are sinking carbon back into that soil and that carbon is staying there because we're not tilling up that soil anymore. As a result of that, the green areas on this graph indicate we're actually sinking more carbon into the soil than we're actually emitting through what we're using with the fertilizers and diesel and all these other fossil fuels. The yellow areas say we're close to net neutral or giving a little bit up. In other words, we're, we're a little bit on the positive side of greenhouse gas emissions. What this says to me is we're doing an excellent job and it's only gonna get better as technologies advance in terms of making sure we're sustainable on the environmental side of things. And, and uh, this was a study done right here in Saskatoon from Dr. Tristan Skolrud at the University of Saskatchewan, but a great indication just in terms of what we're doing. So really when it boils down to it, and then we're gonna get into questions, is 98% of all Canadian farms are family owned. And, and that means my farm is not dissimilar from other farms that you'll see when you're driving by on the highway. And our goal is to make sure we're successful into the next generations. And this is a picture of my, my dad and myself. Uh, and we've taken, my brother and I have taken over the farm about five years ago, uh, officially. And then our intent is to progress this as we go forward to our kids or my nieces or nephews or, or whoever in the family to take it over after that. And, and really the goal is to make sure that the land and the viability of the farm is in a better situation than when I got it. And, and really that is the focal point of that. So with that, I am gonna stop sharing um, the presentation right now, and I'm going to open it up to questions. I know there's a few uh, classrooms uh, that are on the, the call as well, so please feel free if you do have questions from the classrooms to just put them in the chat section, and I will answer questions as we go. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is there are numerous different uh, methods of farming. So this is, uh, I guess you could lump us in with, with a conventional farm, but there are um, are different farms, whether it's uh, organic farms or regenerative agriculture farms. Um, and, and again, we're all kind of in the same purpose of making sure uh, that we can grow food for others here in, in this country and beyond. So do we have any questions? What is the biggest misconception that we would have about farming? Um, I, I think the biggest one would be that either A, we don't care, or B, that we're not being environmentally friendly. Um, I, I, I really hear those a lot, and it's based on the fact that maybe somebody reads something from a special interest group or, or a, a social media post. And I do want to say that, that if we didn't take care of our land and our animals, uh, in the environment, we wouldn't have that ability to, to actually have a farm going forward. So 100%, we need to care for the environment. Uh, we need to care for the wildlife around it. I, I think of the, the rotational grazing side and the livestock side. A lot of instances that the, the, the biggest benefit around uh, grazing and rotational grazing is the fact that wildlife actually lives in that habitat as well. And, and that's one of the big benefits that I see on, on our ranch land back in Lanigan as well. Do we have more questions? Again, feel free to put them in the comment section. Can I ask a question, Clint, live or no? Yeah, sure, go ahead, John. Yeah, mine's more of a comment than a question. I really enjoyed your presentation, particularly on the carbon part. And I'm sure happy that you're making these comments that farmers are not contributing to any problems. We are in fact helping because of what we do I'm putting carbon back in. But uh, mine's a comment, but I would really ask that you continue lobbying just by what you're doing now to make sure that our governments understand that. 
And and I think a lot of them do now. It it really is interesting to to talk about that carbon cycle. Again, a lot of people just look at the gross emissions when it comes to uh, greenhouse gases, not realizing that there is a benefit to what we're doing. And I think there's, especially here in this province, there's a lot more conversations taking place about carbon sequestration. And I would agree that that is front and center and something that I think more people uh, across the country need to hear about. A uh, question from uh, Mr. Croker's class. What equipment did your father use to farm with? Okay, so there's actually a tractor still on our farm that was the same vintage as my dad's birthday, which was 1948. Nope, 47, 1947. So, and we still have it. It's an old John Deere model uh, 1A. Uh, tractor. So he would have used this tractor periodically. Still, when I was growing up, we used it to kind of haul seed back and forth. Um, but we did use horses. Um, I think of numerous times. I, I grew up learning how to hitch up horses and take, uh, uh, whether it's the wagon or a sleigh, um, out into the, uh, um, whether it was to, to move manure or just go for a pleasure uh, ride on the sleigh. Um, my dad also uh, would sometimes use the uh, horses for roping as well with cattle um, back in the day. So, but that's, that's a long time ago. But um, there were still at that time, it wasn't common for farmers, individual farmers to have harvesting machines by themselves. So, you know, one individual would have a harvest crew that would go to the different areas and they would jointly kind of communally um, harvest the, the crops at that time. And over the course of history, what ended up happening is, is um, those processes were combined, and which is why we have the term combine now or harvester, uh, where which you actually take the, the grain, you combine it and thresh it in the same manner, where before you would, you would cut it and you'd put it into bundles and you wait for that threshing crew to, uh, to come out. So um, that would have been kind of um, very early in my dad's existence, but uh, he he would have had um, um, some more modern pieces of equipment like uh, tractors and and combines as well. The the thing is though that the level of comfort has changed substantially, and I, I think my son's on on this as well, and he can attest to the fact that we we now have you know air ride cabs with climate control and radios or Bluetooth systems in them, um, and back when I was starting to farm with my dad, we had cabless things. So cabless tractors, cabless swathers. And I tell you, if, if you ever have experienced the little fuzzies on barley when you're out there and, and have them all over your face and in your pants and underneath your shirt, it's not fun. It, it feels pretty uh, itchy. Uh, next question here. You mentioned that uh, the work the grain farmer does to improve the environment. Are there technologies that also improve livestock farms? For sure, 100%. Um, and I never got into them on this, but uh, I'll take, for example, our, our table egg um, barn. Um, we've adapted uh, new sensor technologies that actually ensure that we know every day um, the amount of feed and water that the birds are drinking. So if, if there's any event that takes place where the feed levels drop, we know, boom, right like that, that there's something wrong with the flock. And it's happened once before where we saw, you know, if, if they were typically eating this amount and then it just slowly dropped, um, there's actually a sensor that went off and it, it phones either my brother or myself and it says something's wrong with your feed, your birds aren't eating enough. Uh, and when we looked and we kind of observed what was happening, the birds had just actually decided not to eat the feed and, and we couldn't figure out what was the matter with this. And we found out that we had some tainted feed from the feed mill. And, and what had happened was we typically have um, flax seed mixed in for, for omega-3 eggs, um, but they had switched to camelina oil. And the camelina oil 
actually was was uh, rancid and the birds just did not like the smell of it or the taste of it so they just stopped eating and and it was such a slight difference for us that I couldn't smell the difference and my brother couldn't uh, but the birds would so there's definitely things like that sensor technology on the cattle side uh, on our ranch in Oklahoma we have things like um, um, uh, ultrasound for, for thickness of ribeyes to actually have the genetics, um, have the genetics better for future herds as well. So all these things uh, on the genetics have been inputted in an effort to uh, get better beef at the end of the day. Uh, from Ms. Bazlak's class, uh, what are the effects of plant-based foods on sustainable farming? About how many eggs do you collect a day? Okay, so uh, plant-based foods. Now, now this is interesting because here in Saskatchewan we produce both, right? We produce plant-based foods and we produce uh, animal-based proteins. Um, really what I want to say with this is it, it comes down to having a balanced approach to this. Um, we need animal agriculture, especially on a lot of our marginal land. If, if we were to take cattle herds out of marginal land, you would actually get no benefit uh, food value from that land. So, and I'm thinking a lot in that southwestern part of the province down by Maple Creek into Fur Mountain in that area. Um, if you didn't ranch cattle that, it would be nothing but rattlesnakes, right? Like there, there's uh, having the benefit to graze cattle similar to what you would with bison uh, back before this land was settled by Europeans. Um, <clears throat> that allows us to actually get some protein off that land that we can't digest. I, I can't digest grass or uh, uh, forages, but a cow can or sheep can because they're ruminants. So, you know, in, in terms of uh, possibly more plant-based protein, if, if people are consuming more, I think to a certain degree, that's fine, but we still need to have that animal protein in the rotations as well. Not only is it beneficial for our own diets, uh, unless you have, have health uh, issues, but it is better for the environment as well. The other thing that I'll say is not all our, our grains that we produce always make Canadian number one feed grade or food grade. Um, sometimes my malting barley that I absolutely love to uh, sell to make beer with, um, sometimes it doesn't make the cut and has to go for feed. And, and if we didn't have cattle or hogs or chickens, uh, we'd have no place for that and it would become actually food waste, which is the other end of things. Uh, so how many eggs do you collect in a day? So I actually don't collect any. Um, <laughs> I, I leave that to my brother and our hired hand, um, but it is an automated system. And, and if uh, anybody does want to take a look, it, it, the video is on with Jackson and me going through the uh, um, process to, uh, to process eggs. Um, but every day we will have roughly about 8,000 eggs um, and we collect them once a day. And pretty much the, the goal with our farm is have close to every hen lay an egg a day, um, but it doesn't always work out that way. We're somewhere around 95 to 97%. Uh, from Aaron Davies, um, what can agriculture producers do to support driving a positive, honest education to the general public about our practices and the safety of their food supply? Uh, great question, Aaron. Um, transparency. 100%. Uh, for those of you who have had the opportunity to take a farm tour, um, you'd be amazed with how much you learn from just talking to a farmer. And, and that is one of the biggest things uh, that I've found working with farm and food care. A lot of people may come in with, with preconceived notions about what happens on a farm or what happens behind those closed doors in that egg barn. And then when you open it up and you show individuals what's actually going on, it's like, oh, Okay, that makes sense. The reason we actually don't let a lot of people into our barns is we don't want the birds to get sick. A lot of people don't realize that. And when you have individuals that think it's, it's their right to bust down a door and, and try and free the birds, um, they don't want, they, they're comfortable there. It's, it's climate controlled. They have all the feed they want, all the water they want. They interact with the other birds. Um, you know, it, it, we're trying to replicate the best behavior practices as possible. And in a lot of instances, that's not necessarily known. And as a result of that, um, 
uh, there's some misconceptions. So the more opportunities we have to either do videos or post on social media or invite classrooms out to your farm, the better it is. And, and I would say if, if I could leave for anybody who's on the call who either A is a farmer or a rancher or B uh, is a dietitian or a teacher or a, in the healthcare profession, just consider um, trying to talk with a, a farmer or a rancher about what they're doing and, and take that step to actually view what they're doing. It, it really is uh, a great opportunity and I've had the privilege to do that quite a few times now with farm and food care, uh, as well as just random people that have uh, messaged me and said, hey, I'm traveling from Vancouver to Toronto. Can I stop by and visit your farm? And I'm, Sure, why not? So I think there's lots that we can talk about and, and lots of uh, uh, opportunities anyways to, to engage consumers to make sure that there is a source for them to ask uh, questions to a farmer. Okay, how big is your farm? Okay, so we own and rent a total of 4,400 acres of land. Now within that, uh, there's, believe it or not, there's bush on our land. Uh, we have waterways, we have sloughs, and we have pasture land. So um, when you take all that land that we can't or we don't feel is, is productive in terms of being a grain, a grain farm, uh, we have about 3,700 acres of actual uh, grain land or land that we would crop. So, um, so roughly speaking anyways, that works out to uh, 700 acres. That would be uh, rangeland or pasture land for cattle production. Um, or just just bush. Um, what if bugs get into your crop while you're collecting harvesting it? How do you get them out? Um, very good question. Um, actually, it, in terms of the bugs that get into the crop, it, it's very minimal. The, the biggest one that I see, and, and uh, those of you who are farmers probably would see, would be grasshoppers. Uh, you do see grasshoppers that get in it. It's pretty hard to sift them out. They tend to go into the, uh, the back of the combine where the grain is in the hopper. Um, it's almost impossible to get them out in the field. What happens is that grain will then be processed and, and it'll be cleaned before it goes. So if you take wheat, for example, the wheat will be cleaned. And as a result of that, the, the insects will be in the, the dirty pile and the, the clean pile will get into your, uh, your flour for bread. So, um, but actually it's, it's not very much. And typically the, the bugs end up going to the top. So if you dig underneath, you see that there's not as many bugs, um, which does lead to another question. What happens if the, the bugs actually start eating your crop? Um, and this is something that we, we take near and dear to our heart and, and, and on the sustainability side as well. We've been fairly fortunate on our farm to not have to use insecticides uh, very often in the last five, six years, we've used insecticides once. Um, so as a result of that, it's, it's, um, it's just been beneficial growing conditions. Uh, but if we have to use an insecticide to kill, say, Bertha armyworms or diamondback moss or grasshoppers that are infesting a field, um, then we will use them. But we would use it very sparingly and have to stay within the, the restrictions from the government on that. Uh, what type of building are the chickens living in? So the, the, the birds live in a, a, it's a big barn. It's, it's actually 18 feet tall, uh, 40 feet wide and 130 feet long. Um, and again, if, if you want, uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can see different uh, videos of, of the birds in the barn. Um, but in our barn, it's actually called a free run aviary barn. So there's different levels of the barn that the birds can flap around and fly up. Um, and as a result of that, there's, there's lots of room for them to interact and, and uh, uh, flop around and, and get exercise and whatnot. And, and all the barns have their plus and minuses. There are, um, there's other barns called enriched housing or the traditional system of, of eggs. Um, they all have their pros and cons and independent on, on different farmers practices. Any other questions? These are excellent questions. I appreciate the questions from the students. And I, I do want to add, this is actually um, Agriculture Literacy Month in the province of, actually in the rest of Canada as well. So it's great that we're having an opportunity to talk about farming and ranching and, and how your food is grown. And uh, I do want to add too that there's, there's never 
uh, an end to this. You, you can always ask me more questions too if something comes up afterwards. Um, I'm not going anywhere um, and, and I would always entertain some of that. And yeah, Dorothy just posted uh, a video tour of the egg barn. Uh, it's a YouTube link there. Feel free if you want to watch it some other time, you can do so. Um, and I'll keep it open for questions. We do have nine minutes on this, this Zoom call left if there are more questions. And if not, we can end this a little bit early. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other questions that typically come up. Um, I, I do want to say too, when I, when I make the term family farm, I, I'm, I'm genuine about that. My, my wife, Laura, does uh, help out on the farm. She runs one of our combines during the uh, harvest season. Um, we also have uh, Jackson sometimes helps. Uh, my father helps. Uh, my mother helps out. Uh, it really is a family affair when it comes to our, our business. Student question, do you butcher chickens on your farm? Okay, so, so there is a, that's a good question. And there is a difference, a fundamental difference between a layer and a broiler. So a broiler chicken is what you would use for meat. So that would be your uh, chicken strips or chicken sandwich, whatever it happens to be. And a layer would be specifically for eggs. So every year and roughly about every 52 to 54 weeks, we will actually rotate the flock. So when it's time for that flock to go out, we make every effort possible to find a home for those birds. The thing is, they're not very tasty at that age. They're already, um, so they've been in our barn for roughly a year and we usually get them when they're about 18 weeks old. So um, the only really uh, good thing that you can use from the meat from those birds is actually uh, soup meat or, or uh, further processed uh, chicken. Um, so we do try and find a home for majority of those birds, the, the most uh, as we can, um, to make sure that they're used to the best of the ability and, and no waste. Uh, but in terms of butchering chickens on our farm, no. I, <laughs> I grew up doing that when we didn't have a larger uh, poultry operation, and um, I'll leave it to the experts in Maple Leaf and, and Prairie Pride and Lilydale to do. So uh, I don't do that. Um, in terms of other videos, uh, Penny just posted, there are videos in Canadian Food Focus. Again, a good opportunity for you just to look at some of the nutritional facts, um, recipes as well uh, that are out there. Uh, I will put in a plug too, we're planning to have what's called Ag in the City um, coming up in April. And uh, that'll be different um, opportunities for you to learn uh, how to cook new, new items and learn a little bit about how that food was actually grown uh, in the ingredient list and try to have as much um, content from Saskatchewan as possible. Uh, when did you butcher you, when did you butcher for food? What was the general time of hatch to process? Okay, good question. So you're lucky enough, I'm, I actually used to be the CEO, the Chief uh, Executive Officer for the Saskatchewan Marketing Board. Um, so I know all these timelines from front to back. Um, so when the, the broiler uh, birds were, are being produced here in Saskatchewan, so the egg would be laid by a fertilized egg. That's another difference too. So we have no roosters in our barn. There's zero roosters. So the possibility of having a fertilized egg other than some miracle from God is zero. Okay, so there's no fertilized eggs in our, our barn. It's impossible. And I'll let your teachers explain why you need a rooster um, to have a fertilized egg with the hen. But um, in terms of, of the egg, if you have a fertilized egg, it goes into an incubator for 21 days. Now after 21 days that uh, egg will hatch and then that hatched uh, chick will go to a broiler farm and they typically spend anywhere from about 35 to 45 days in that barn before they're about two kg birds. And that's roughly the weight that the processing companies want for um, chicken meat. That's um, the right kind of size for processing. So it's, it's fairly quick. Um, and, and a lot of the, the advancements in the genetics on that is just to adapt the birds that could actually convert the grain and, and that energy into meat the quickest were just selected over time as well. So. Um, all, all with natural selection of birds. But a good question too from Mr. Croker's class. Uh, any other questions? Four more minutes left. I'm trying to think of, of something else in terms of um, 
the uh, the process on the farm. Uh, the, the other thing too, like just in terms of, of one thing I, I forgot to mention, when we plant our crop, um, when you're actually just directly seeding with a narrow um, knife in the ground, so it, it, it goes into the ground, cuts the soil, and makes a little bit of a furrow for the seed and fertilizer to pop down, it takes far less energy than if I had a, a 12 inch wide uh, shovel that's digging into the soil. And this is another reason uh, or way we actually reduced our amount of, of fossil fuels that we need. Um, I pretty much idle my tractor. My tractor is idling at a, around 17 to 1800 RPMs, um, depending on how fast I wanna go. And as a result of that, I can fill up my big tractor once and sometimes I'll go for two days without having to fill it again, just because um, we're burning less fossil fuels because we're not tilling up that soil, which is another uh, definite um, benefit from um, the, uh, the planting systems that we're do using. So I'm gonna give one last uh, shout out for questions and then we're gonna close it. How fast does a combine go when you're harvesting? Well, if Jackson's driving that combine, I have to tell him to slow down because he's gonna plug it up, but it depends on the crop. So um, the picture that I showed you with that big um, cutting system, the header on it, that's actually taking the standing, uh, that was oats and cutting it and putting it into the combine. Um, that's 40 feet wide. So when we were using that and, and harvesting our oats, I could go between about two and a half and maybe at the most three miles an hour. So not very fast, um, but depending on the crop in, in canola, I, I tend to go a little bit faster. It's more like three and a half to four miles an hour. Um, and when you have two combines doing that, you can take off a lot of land in one day. And that's uh, just going back to that picture of the, the harvesting crews, the black and white picture, um, all that harvesting that those uh, many workers were doing out there, um, I, I could probably do in a, a matter of, you know, 30 minutes with our two combines. It's just, it's that much more efficient and, uh, and that much uh, quicker. And, and we do, uh, like uh, the, the other question is, you know, whether or not uh, you go at the same speed for all crops, and no, definitely not. Uh, canola seems to dry down a lot quicker and it's easier to shell that pod. That pod that holds all the little black canola seeds that, that gives you canola oil. Um, very easy to shell, um, but it's a little tougher with things like oats or uh, wheat is another one that takes a little bit more time and it takes more horsepower to actually thresh that crop. Great questions. I appreciate that very much for everybody uh, listening in. Like I mentioned before, if you do have any other questions, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Uh, we do have more things. Uh, just check our website in the future. And with that, I want to say thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you all the best. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye.